Our first guest is a television pioneer. He began in 1939 on KHJ Los Angeles, the yep. first franchise TV station in the country. He later starred in his own show and helped initiate late-night TV talk shows as an alternating host on uh, NBC's Broadway Open House. Sounds like a very interesting person. Really? What a guy. And, yeah. of course, during the late 60s, he portrayed uh, comedy writer Buddy Sorrell on the Dick Van Dyke Show, Maury Amsterdam. Ta-da! Ta That's in lieu of an orchestra, which we didn't show up today. <laughs> Listen, that was a beautiful introduction you gave me. Incredible. I did start way back in those days, and... I don't know if you have ever seen any pictures, but I was looking at one the other day, and the cameraman will get a kick out of this. Shows that this is 1939, and they had cameras, but the guys didn't have viewfinders. They had a guess where you were. This is the truth. I got a snapshot of it you wouldn't believe. And everybody on the show looked like Marcel Marceau because the lights were unbearable, and the only way you could get a picture was we all wore completely white makeup with, you know, black around the nose and the lips and everything. And you couldn't stay under the lights for any more than 15 minutes at a time. What kind of shows did you do? Well, uh, what do you do with an experimental show? You go yeah. out and you do a few jokes, and we must have had a worldwide audience of maybe 70 people in those days. And I'll tell you something else that, that some of the old-timers might remember who got televisions in the early days. The tube, the picture was upside down. Did you know that? A mirror. Yeah, you yeah. looked here, and an RCA, I think, came out with a thing. When you turned the lid up, you looked into the mirror, and that's how you got your picture. And the, the picture was about this big, and the set was about twice the size of this room. I never I never understood why, they, uh, with the mirror, everything must have been reversed then. Did they ever do writing on the screen, or did you have to do it backwards? No, I don't know what they did, but I don't think we did writing. I'm sure we didn't have titles or anything, or else we turned them around. But that was it. It came up. Here was the picture, flat. If you looked at it this way, it was upside down, and it was straight in the mirror. How did you get into television in 1939? Well, I was a daredevil, and I had been in radio ever since I was 10 years old. And I just figured, well, hey, any kind of a new medium on top of that, I'm a camera, not, and always have been. And anything along photographic lines in any manner always interests me. Yeah, because it must have been... Uh during the, uh, the Second World War. I was the first guy who took a picture of a Jap taking a picture of a Jap. No. It's called, oh, yes, it goes no. way back. <laughs> <laughs> well, what is that? What you is took, what? You took a picture of what? You don't hear well. You should get a 22, blow the wax out of your ears. Now, I just told you the whole thing. You're sitting there like a nut, like you're listening, and you're not saying it. No, seriously. And now, of course, everything is wonderful. They have this satellite so that the news guys can get the wrong weather more accurately. You know what I mean? Little things like that. It's television. You got another wonderful. news show coming on. The, yep. The Disney Channel. Yep. And uh, this coming we week. We just plugged. Which it's a yeah, Disney it's show, nice I should say. say that. It's, it's a show called... Believe you can, and you can, and it's a whimsical kind of a thing. And the uh, the little girl who works with me, Heather O'Rourke, such a darling little kid, from unspoiled. Yes, yeah, from Poltergeist and also on Happy Days, and she's absolutely wonderful. She's seven years old. She looks like she's four, and she can drive you a little nuts if you're older because she picks up a script and reads it like she's 25. Jeez. And she's an unspoiled, wonderful little girl. I think she's going to be a very big star. Mm -hmm. There was just a book about the, uh, the get-together of the Dick Van Dyke Show. The Dick show. Van Dyke Show. They uh, called the Dick Van Dyke Show the anatomy of a classic, and we had kind of a launching party. Yeah, which well, we the whole unfortunately gang. missed because we were stuck here working. But yeah, well, we you should have been there because the whole gang was there, Carl and... Uh, you know, all the gang, yeah. Ronnie Jacobs. and uh, I never realized that that show actually started out with Carl Reiner yes, being he did the it Dick first. Van Dyke it was, character. Yeah, he did it. It was a, he called it uh, Head of the Family. Mm -hmm. And he showed me the original <laughs> film of it, and he was right. He was just no good for it, and he knew it. He was smart enough to know that he was not the right guy for it, so he and Danny Thomas and Sheldon Leonard went out looking for a fella, and they went to see the show Bye Bye Birdie in New York, and there was Dick, and there was Robert Petrie, and the show went from there. Yeah. Did and you realize then what kind nah. of show you were getting into? Actually, the first 13 weeks, we were almost canceled because we were in 111th place. Today, if you're in 111th place, they don't even allow you in town. But we were in Isn't 100... Isn't that 111? Now, let me explain why. In those days, Perry Como had the number one television show in America which went on at 9 o'clock on Tuesday nights for an hour. Right. We went on at 9.30 for a half hour. Now, you're not going to look at a show with big stars and everything to turn to a show that people that you hardly ever heard of a half hour later. Right. The show was great, but nobody saw it. And Sheldon Leonard went uh, to Cincinnati, practically got down on his hands and knees to Procter & Gamble and said, this is a great show. People haven't seen it. Give it a chance. They kept it on for the summer, and the rest is history. Sheldon Leonard. 
You ever see him in the old movies where he used to always, oh, he always used to play the tough the, guy. Yeah. The tough guy. Yeah. You look at him as a, I must tell you about Sheldon Leonard. When we finished the show, I wrote him a letter thanking him for an education because he's the best seen fixer that I've ever seen in my life. He can look at a scene and he knows in two minutes what's right and wrong. And he was always such a gentleman. He'd sit there and never stop the scene in progress during the run through, you know. Mm -hmm. And when it was over, he'd look, he said, just great. Just great, everything was wonderful. If I may make a little suggestion, and by the time he got through with his suggestions, and he was always right, we corrected the scene and it was lovely. Rose Marie used to call him Pontius Pilate. She'd see, walks in, makes his little comment, walks out, you know. <laughs> <laughs> How but many? We, I think that was the, the real success of the Van Dyke show was because it was a happy wedding of the right people in front of the camera and in back of the camera. Well, when I saw you on Good Morning America, yeah, when you, they had part of the gang reunited, yeah. You brought along some outtakes yeah. of the of the show, and obviously everybody had fun doing it. Well, actually, we had so much fun doing the show. People like Danny Thomas and uh, uh, Lucille Ball, Jack Benny used to come in and watch us. We're supposed to be rehearsing. They'd look at us and say, "How do you idiots ever get a show on the air?" Because we were having so much fun with it. It was, you know, it's kind of cliche to say a, a real happy family, but we were. We all loved each other. We all got to work on time. We enjoyed working together, and I think it kind of showed through on the screen. There has been revivals of shows like My Three Sons, Father Knows Best, yeah. uh, recently Leave it to Beaver. Is yeah. there any possibility of you guys getting back together? Well, there's quite a bit of talk about it. As even we had talk on the night of the uh, launching the party, party for the book that uh, we might even do a movie together. So we're waiting to see what the results of it are. But I think it would have a big audience, and I think it would be a real winner. You were... A writer, still are. Yeah, but I didn't start as a writer. I started in vaudeville as a performer, as a comic. Yeah, but uh, I remember on the show, and uh, I used to see on interviews and things, yeah. you were like the human joke machine. Yeah. People would give you a subject. I must tell you, it's a dangerous business. It's more like being uh, the fastest draw in the West. People don't even say hello to you. Say hello, uh, or just say, hey, tell me a joke about a bird, about anything, a cop, did he, any, uh, anything. Did he get you know? like that? Yeah, I'd gotten so, you know, I was afraid to talk to people. But then it became part of my life, and the joke machine was made by my father-in-law. It looked like a, it hung around my neck, it looked like an old organ grinder thing like this. And people, it was so funny, because people would uh, call out a name or not, and I'd take a piece of paper and I'd say, uh, what's in there, what do you want to hear about, uh, a policeman? All right, I'd take it, put it in the box, grind it, and out would come a piece of paper with nothing on it. But I would read it and tell a joke about a policeman. I said, I read, just read in the paper that a famous Chicago mobster died and left a widow and 12 policemen without my means of support. Or any kind of a joke, whatever it was. And I would take the paper and throw it on the floor. And when the show was over, people would get up and start looking for the paper. They wanted to read the joke. <laughs> and then we'd get letters from people and say, where can you get one of those machines? They'd be great for parties. <laughs> they yeah. thought it was a real one. <laughs> yeah. but, but I'm very, very happy with... Uh, with the show that we did, Believe You Can and You Can. It'll be on 8 o'clock on Thursday night. On if you're show? on, on uh, no, it's uh, an independent, uh, I think Channel 11 here oh. in Los Angeles. Okay. And it's uh, throughout the country in a great, great many stations. Terrific. And I, I was kind of an old fashioned picture. Everybody had their clothes on. So I, I think <laughs> that's going to work pretty good. We're going to bring that stuff back. All right. All right. Marty Ingalls is with us when we come back. I know that fellow. Oh, right. oh. A thousand years. Oh. Funny man. Oh.